My name is Micah Herskind. Um, I'm an organizer based in Atlanta, um, and my pronouns are he, him. Um, I work for um, an organization here um, that tries um, to combat criminalization in the state of Georgia and in Atlanta. Um, and I also organize with a group called Georgia Freedom Letters, um, which runs a pen pal program um, between those in and out of prisons in Georgia. Um, so before jumping in tonight, um, I wanna say that I'm really excited to share with you all tonight. And I also really wanna make clear that I'm coming to um, the study and struggle against the PIC as a learner. Um, and that even since writing the piece, there are um, new things that I've learned that I've tried to incorporate into this presentation. Um, and so I, you know, I, I hope that that learning continues and I, and I know it will. Um, and so much of what we will talk about tonight um, and what's in the article that was referenced um, and that we'll be working through is really the result of conversations um, and struggle with comrades and mentors who have shaped my analysis um, and particularly people who were deeply involved in the struggle against Cop City, um, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, and then we're gonna get started, um, is that this presentation represents only my views um, and not necessarily anybody that I work for. Got to give the disclaimer. All right. Um, so jumping in, I want to give an overview of what we'll be talking about tonight. Um, so the main goals for the night um, are first to really define and visualize the prison industrial complex. Um, we're going to get into some of the definitions and existing visualizations of the PIC asking why is the PIC a useful concept? Um, what actually is it? How have organizers and scholars um, theorized it? And then how can we put it on paper um, and visualize it? Um, second, and this is really gonna be um, the bulk of the night, um, we're gonna use a recent example out of Atlanta, where like I said, I work and organize, um, to map some of the various actors that make up the PIC on the ground. So we're going to ask, how can we put specific names and faces and institutions to, um, to the PIC and really conceptualize um, in a really concrete way um, how, how the PIC can manifest. Um, and we're gonna be using this map um, that I think anyone who, who was able to read the piece um, will have seen and try to really work through um, each of these actors as well as um, some actors that didn't make it on that you know, I hope will, will um, lead to an updated map one day. Um, and then last, we're gonna introduce a tool that I hope will be helpful um, in helping organizers and others who wanna create a similar map to, to what you just saw um, to do so in your city or county or you know, whatever, whatever, whatever local area you are. Um, and I'll say that I think ultimately, as we um, continue organizing to build power and to create the abolitionist future that we believe in, um, I hope that the tool is helpful in understanding, and, and this workshop is helpful in understanding that our organizing efforts really have to work on as many fronts as the PIC does. Um, that if punishment is everywhere, then abolition has to be everywhere as well. Um, and that if we focus too narrowly in on one actor or one sector or one institution, um, our organizing can become siloed. Um, and so hopefully this is helpful in putting together some of the pieces. Um, I'll also note that um, we'll be taking a 10 minute break partway through in order to give our access team a break. Um, and then we'll hopefully end with some time for questions, which you can also feel free uh, to drop in the chat as we go. So jumping in, um, let's just start by asking why the PIC? Um, why focus in on this way of thinking about our system? We know that there are a variety of terms um, when it comes to describing the way things are, um, especially when it comes to an analysis of the punishment system. So terms such as the carceral state and mass incarceration um, you know, also come to mind. And you will see tonight, there are a lot of transitions and I hope that you appreciate them because I was very excited about these transitions. Um, so I'll say both, I think both of these terms, you know, certainly have their uses. And I think that they can be woven into our understanding of the PIC in a helpful way. Um, but what I found really compelling and useful about the PIC in particular is its ability to illuminate the ways in which our political economic system is really built around policing, punishment, and surveillance. 
Um, so I think it helps us think about the way in which the, punis the punishment system is actually a core feature of our entire system of governance. Um, and then the other reason why the PIC um, is that, as we know, the past two years has seen an explosion in popular uprisings, um, abolitionist organizing and political education efforts like this workshop series, um, movement building work, mutual aid efforts. Um, you know, all, all, there's been this explosion in activity and movement. Um, and that's all happened against the backdrop of ongoing systemic violence, the pandemic, um, and the, really the daily devastation of our racial capitalist system. Um, we've seen police precincts burn. We've seen mass mobilizations. Um, we've seen organizers notch wins across budgets and policy. Um, and we also saw 44% of voters in a major city vote to abolish their police department. Um, when many of those people probably had not heard the term abolish the police just a few years prior. Um, at the same time, we know that we've seen various concerted efforts against radical movements by a broad range of actors. Um, so over the past years, especially, we've seen the ways in which corporate media has promoted crime wave narrative after crime wave narrative, um, telling sensationalized stories that stir up fear of our neighbors, um, and in particularly those, um, those who are homeless. Um, we've seen media not just reflecting back what's happening, um, but actively shaping reality and crafting narratives that are used to counteract radical movements. We also know that politicians across political lines have been working to increase police budgets and denounce the defund movement. We have mayors of large cities devoting COVID funding to police budgets. Um, and we know that despite some promising victories from the defund movement, many localities across the country have actually increased their police budgets. Um, we have a Democratic president who has continued his legacy as architect of mass criminalization. Um, and, you know, he called both on the campaign trail and now that he's in office to massively increase police and military and ICE spending. And um, my understanding is that his 2023 budget does increases funding for those agencies more than Trump um, even did. We also know that reforms across cities and states um, are all seeing massive rollback efforts. Um, and those rollback efforts often look to make things worse than they were even pre-reform. Um, that is certainly the case here in Georgia where following a couple of years of state and local level misdemeanor bail reform, um, we've seen efforts to increase pretrial detention across the board, including um, current legislation in Georgia that would mandate cash bail for every single felony offense. Um, so we know that um, you know, the, these rollback efforts are in full force. At the height of the uprisings in particular, we saw how well-funded nonprofit organizations put out recommendations and materials that really watered down radical and revolutionary demands. We saw organizations with enormous endowments and budgets eat up donations that could have gone to grassroots organizations. Um, and we saw well-respected civil rights organizations really shun the defund movement and instead call for things like police to become transformed into guardians rather than um, warriors and, and you know, become this institution that could actually protect people. We also know that police power has in many places continued to grow and that police budgets are eating up more resources. Um, and organized police forces and their representatives have worked overtime to confront movement demands and increase their own impunity. Um, and we know that the few symbolic convictions of police officers um, are meant to placate rebellion. Um, and, and that's really the most that those in office um, are willing to offer. This is the last one. Um, we know that corporations who shared Black Lives Matter social media posts during the summer of 2020 have continued their practices of wage theft and union busting um, and support for policing in many forms. We've seen developers continue to eat up land and push people out of their communities and city governments aid them in that effort through rezoning practices and major subsidies for huge corporations. So in other words, we're in a moment where it's clear how many moving pieces there are to this exploitative and destructive system known as racial capitalism. And we know that policing and punishment are at the center of so much of it. So why the PIC? 
I think organizing against the status quo of, of how things stand requires understanding how all of these pieces fit together, understanding how to chart the moving pieces um, and, and see how they, how they act together to expand the scope of policing and punishment. And I think that that's really where the PIC has so much to offer us. So defining the PIC, um, the prison industrial complex is a term that has entered a lot of people's vocabularies as a way of understanding and analyzing the ways in which so many different systems and institutions interlock around punishment, policing, and surveillance. Um, and I think the PIC really gives us language to understand what it means for an entire political economic system to be shaped really around violence, um, the violence of punishment and policing. Um, and so I want to start by working through a couple short definitions. This first one comes from Critical Resistance, who has really led the way in a lot of ways around um, the abolition movement, in resistance to the PIC, um, and in creating so much movement infrastructure that I think made moments like 2020 uprisings possible. Um, so this first definition, they define the PIC as a term used to describe the overlapping interests of government and industry that use surveillance, policing, and imprisonment as solutions to economic, social, and political problems. So to draw that out, um, the overlapping interests of government and industry. Right from the start, we're talking about how the state, and it, we're talking about the state and industry, how their interests overlap, how they work together and shape each other. We're talking about them using the tools of surveillance, policing, and imprisonment. These are the tools they're using as solutions to economic, social, and political problems. So when we think about the PIC, we're thinking about a range of institutions that have a shared interest in using the tools of punishment to respond to all of these different problems. Um, and we know that the system we live in produces a whole number of problems, homelessness, poverty, unclean drinking water, underfunded schools, inadequate infrastructure, deeply embedded racism and ableism and queer and transphobia and classism in and across our institutions. Um, and we also know that this abandonment of so many people produces dissent and leads people to take to the streets and call for something different. Um, and so all of these economic, social and political problems are things that the police are then deployed to handle, to address. Our second definition comes from Rose Brewer and Nancy Heitzig, um, and they define the PIC as a self-perpetuating machine where the vast profits and perceived political benefits lead to policies that are additionally designed to ensure an endless supply of clients for the criminal justice system. Um, and so I want to specifically draw out this idea that the PIC is a self-perpetuating machine, that it's continually defending and reproducing and expanding itself. Um, and so it really describes the way in which our, our system of governance has become dependent on policing and punishment for its basic functioning. So the PIC is an endless cycle of punishment of its own making, where every significant actor in it has a stake in the punishment system somehow. So they are reliant on punishment for what they understand as their success. Um, so every day, our system is actively producing the very problems that it then solves through criminalization. Um, and part of what we're going to be doing today or tonight um, is trying to identify, you know, who these actors are and what their stake is in the punishment system, um, what it actually means for them to be, you know, reliant on um, the criminal justice or the, yeah, the criminal legal system, the criminal punishment system. Um, and then this third quote is actually a fragment of a quote from Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Craig Gilmore. Um, and I've included it here to help us think about how many different actors are involved in what we call the PIC and to expand our minds to think about the different types of infrastructure and relationships and institutions and actors who are tied up in the system. Um, so they refer to the PIC as an elaborate set of relationships, institutions, buildings, laws, urban and rural places, personnel, equipment, finances, dependencies, technocrats, opportunists, and intellectuals in the public, private, and not-for-profit sectors. 
I want to also note that while the term um, PIC was first popularized in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, it's important to recognize that as with any vocabulary of resistance to the punishment system, the term has roots in movements by incarcerated radicals and organizers. Um, so this is a quote from the North Carolina Prisoners Union in 1974. Um, and it's available in Dan Berger and Emily Hobson's incredible um, edited volume, Remaking Radicalism. Um, and here the union is really remarking on how the system targets and punishes the poor by design um, and how that reality is a reflection of a broader society that criminalizes the poor and protects the rich. Um, and so in other words, these concepts have really deep legacies and histories. Um, and then now before moving on, I want to give um, a caution that comes from Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Craig Gilmore, um, which is that the term the PIC has become warped in some ways. Um, and so they wrote this in 2007, um, and I'm going to read it now. Um, so they say, the term the PIC gained wide popularity after the historic 1998 Critical Resistance Conference, um, but almost as rapidly it lost its meaningful breadth. By becoming too narrow, the PIC became less accurate. The phrase intended to resonate with, rather than simply mimic, the military industrial complex has not fulfilled its potential to help people theorize adequately how the PIC shapes political and social life for everyone. As a result, it has yet to become a broadly useful tool in mobilizing opposition to the complex's continued expansion. We must note that the hollowing out of the term and the skewed political vision thus implied has often come from those who use the term with the most enthusiasm. Along the way, the meaning of industrial shrank to profit and the state disappeared behind the specter of immoral gain. In this view, the outcome of capitalist activity stands in for the complicated relationships that enable or change that outcome. Um, I won't be reading off the screen, I think, for, for most of the rest of the night. Um, but what I take from this, um, even as I continue to learn about the PIC, is that when we're thinking about and organizing against the PIC, we have to be attentive to a broad range of relationships and institutions. And we need to pay especially close attention to state and state act, to the state and state actors, um, which can too often disappear behind some of the flashy headlines that we see in particular about private prisons or a particularly evil corporation. Um, and so in other words, the PIC is not just or even close to mostly about private prison companies. It doesn't exist because of a couple greedy corporations who got together and started a conspiracy to cage a bunch of people. Um, and it's not primarily driven by private prison corporations. Um, so before moving on to the substance of tonight, which we're about to dive into, um, I wanna quickly show two visualizations of the PIC. Um, and both of these are available in the tool that we'll talk about later. So this first one from Melissa Birch of Critical Resistance shows in concentric circles the way the PIC works. Um, and so it begins with a set of interests that comprise the PIC. So they reference guard unions, politicians, governments and government actors, um, developers and construction companies, private prison companies, investment banks, law enforcement, victims' rights groups, prison industries, and DAs. Um, and we know that there are there are far more, and you know we'll talk about some tonight. Um, but that visual then works outward through the many forces that empower the PIC, um, the tools of punishment that the PIC uses, what social, political, and economic problems those tools are used to address, who it impacts, and what it results in. Um, and you'll notice when you, if you <laughs> turn your head, um, that the that the results of the system are the very problems that the PIC is supposedly responding to or solving. And so in other words, the issues that are supposedly demonstrating the need for the PIC are actually the products of the PIC. The second one comes from the Corrections Documentary Project, um, and we're not going to spend much time on it, um, but I think it's also a valuable visual. Um, in the way that it demonstrates how many different actors are involved in the PIC. 
So it points not only to companies that are explicitly profiting from incarceration, uh, but also to the role of urban developers and industry representatives, the media, advocacy groups, thanks to, and think tanks and others in promoting punishment. So it helps us to see um, you know, how many different actors are really involved in this system. Okay, so we've got the PIC down in theory. Hopefully, I think that was the PIC in like 15 minutes. Um, and, you know, I think broadly, we're talking about the ways in which a vast number of public and private institutions use and rely upon policing and punishment to address the many political problems that they themselves create. Um, but I think even with those definitions, it can be really hard to understand in practice. So what does it actually mean for actors to be reliant on the system? What does that look like? Um, how do they actually go about advocating for increased policing and punishment? Um, and what does that look like? I think, you know, if, if understanding the PIC is about understanding relationships of power, I think we can ask, how do we begin to map those relationships um, and put together the pieces of, of, of how this is working? Um, so what we're going to be moving into now um, is we're going to use a recent example out of Atlanta to begin mapping some of these relationships of the PIC really on the ground. Um, and again, hopefully, hopefully folks have had a chance um, in reading the piece to take a look at this map. Um, and if not, we'll, we'll start to work through it now. So um, let's start by just sort of setting the scene in Atlanta. So in September 2021, the Atlanta City Council voted yes on a plan to destroy 85 acres of Atlanta's South River Forest, um, which was home to the old Atlanta prison farm. So it's on land originally stolen from the Muscogee Creek people um, that was used from 1920 through the 1980s to force incarcerated people um, held there to produce crops and to work on projects for the city, um, including forcing people to construct their own cages. Um, and the Atlanta Press Collective is an amazing local group um, in Atlanta that has really documented this thoroughly. Um, so the proposal voted on by council um, would destroy the forest on this land. Um, and so what you see in this rendering um, is, is all forest land right now. And, and this is what, you know, this is their rosy green version of what um, the facility would look like. Um, and so it would destroy the forest on this land currently and replace it with a massive, noisy, toxic police training facility. So wiping out a forest that is key to preventing flooding and preventing oncoming climate disaster and replacing it with an institution that will literally expand the footprint of policing just a year after the uprisings against ongoing police violence. Um, and it should be noted that the, the land used to create this police training facility would result in a facility larger than that of either Los Angeles or New York City, despite Atlanta having um, a significantly smaller police force. So there was massive resistance in response to the proposal um, and organizers called this proposal Cop City. So they call it the police training facility um, and organizers really rallied and shifted the narrative to refer to this as Cop City. And so a huge range of organizations came out against the proposal. Um, people marched, they did direct actions, they circulated petitions, they protested outside of council members' houses, they canvassed neighborhoods across Atlanta to mount opposition. Um, they brought in national attention and there were whole neighborhood associations closest to the proposed site that were putting out statements against it. So you saw this really unified public front against Cop City. Um, the campaign brought together abolitionists, environmental justice organizers, anti-gentrification groups, mutual aid groups, youth organizers, um, and even more sort of typically apolitical organizations and individuals. There was this broad range of people who just overwhelmingly said no. One poll of Atlantans found 98% of people who were, who were polled were opposed to building Cop City at the site of the South River Forest. Um, and when it came time for the final vote in September 2021, organizers mobilized people for over 17 hours of public comment where people called in to voice their opposition to the proposal. So over 17 hours of people calling in to city council to give their opinion on the proposal. 
Um, and when we look at the breakdown of those calls, we see that there were over 1,100 callers. And of those, 70% of callers were opposed to Cop City for a broad range of reasons that they shared and that was documented by a community tally. Um, then of course we had 30% who did support Cop City. Um, and those of us who were listening to the comment saw sort of a clear set of demographics emerge amongst um, that 30%. And so really the 30% were cops, firefighters who would also have training space at the new facility, um, and then individuals from Northeast Atlanta and particularly Buckhead. Um, if you know anything about Buckhead, you know that it is the heart of the white economic power structure in Atlanta, which most recently led a secession effort to secede from the city. Um, and they have been on the front lines for years in efforts to roll back reforms and increase criminalization, particularly of young black people. So that's who called into support. Um, and on the other hand, you had people calling from every other district in the city, um, and in particular, the area closest to the site who were saying, no, don't do this. So despite all of this opposition, when it came time to vote, all but four members of the city council voted yes. And in fact, they voted yes with essentially no discussion or acknowledgement of the 17 hours of public comment over two days that they had just listened to. Some of the city council members who ultimately voted no tried for some amendments that were shot down pretty quickly by the full council um, and eventually the proposal passed. You can see the vote break down here from the night of. Um, and so I think with all of this, we come up against an obvious question and I'm just checking the chat, okay. Um, so, so we have an obvious question, right? Which is how did this happen? Um, and I think the, the easy answer is of course that our elected officials are not accountable <laughs> to the community and they don't respond to our wishes. Um, and they actually tend to mostly ignore what their actual constituents think. Um, and I think that's an important realization for many of us to come to, um, but it's not necessarily the most useful when we're thinking about organizing or building power for a different system um, or in understanding on the flip side who these people are accountable to. And so it's this how question um, of how did this happen that I think can allow us to begin mapping some of the relationships that make up the PIC. And so the claim that I really wanna make that will carry us through tonight um, is that understanding this you know, blatantly anti-democratic vote by city council really requires understanding how the PIC works in function. Um, it works and functions you know, on the ground in a concrete way to expand the power and scope of policing and punishment at enormous human and environmental costs. We know that there will be massive costs associated with this new facility. Um, and that really we need to look at a broad range of actors that we're gonna dive into to understand how the PIC works to suppress political dissent, to subvert democratic engagement and to protect profits. So any sort of mapping effort is going to be incomplete, um, but in working through this story and series of events, we can get started by looking at the media. Um, so as we work through each of these actors and institutions, we're gonna ask what they did um, and what their stake in policing and punishment is um, as a way to understand both how the PIC functions on the ground and how all of these different institutions are tied into the system. Um, and so as we work through these actors, I know this is not a very interactive um, workshop, but I'd love for people to put in the comments times that you've seen um, you know, similar actors do similar things in your city. So if we're talking about um, the media, I, you know, I think it would be amazing to drop in, what do you see your local media doing? Um, and we can see if that works. And depending on how people are feeling, maybe we can create our own little loose collective map throughout this session. All right, so the media. Um, so this proposal for, for Cop City originally came before the entire city council in mid-August of 2021. So one month before the final vote where they voted yes. Um, it had made its way through city council committees at that point um, and had significant public opposition each time. Um, and yet even still, many people expected that proposal to be approved at the August city council meeting. 
it was only because of the significant opposition um, and the fact that the, the main proponent of the proposal had not even reached out to the local county commissioners closest to where the facility would be built um, that resulted in council really narrowly voting to delay the ordinance. So in other words, they didn't vote it down, but they said, we'll come back to this at our next meeting. You know, we need more time. And that in itself would have never happened without you know, this massive opposition campaign. But the day after that August vote to delay the proposal, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution editorial board, um, so the AJC's editorial board, they are the paper of record in Atlanta, they released this editorial that you see on screen. And this is the original print version. And so you can see they say, crime wave should spur action on center, loud and clear. In it, they wrote that, um, quote, crime won't politely observe the delay. Criminals will continue to ply their trade, extracting a cost in property, public fears, and even lives. In other words, this delay, they say, is costing lives. And you know, potentially, the organizers who fought for the delay might even be seen as responsible for the additional costs in property, fears, and lives. They write, it's no exaggeration to say better trained officers may well save lives during routine encounters with the public. And they say this despite the fact that the police officer who murdered Rayshard Brooks in Atlanta, Garrett Rolfe, himself took over 2,000 hours worth of training. This was, not the this was not even close to the first time that the AJC had published in support of building Top City. And so in fact, for months, they had been running opinion pieces on why this new center was so crucial, how it could turn the tide of the crime wave, how it could be really the answer to valuing public safety. And when we look at who was given the space to write these articles, we see a former police chief, we see the CEO of the Atlanta Police Foundation, and we see another CEO of a major corporation, as well as a board member of the Atlanta Police Foundation. Um, and so as all of these are being published, by my count, the AJC did not publish one piece in opposition to the training center. And so clearly, the AJC is supporting this thing on an institutional level through the editorial and publishing decisions that they're making. And again, we know that the media doesn't just reflect, but instead often shapes public opinion and puts pressure on lawmakers to act in a certain way. We know that Crime stories give police more legitimacy because the, the stated or the implicit answer to any you know, horrible crime story is that the only way to stop this horrible thing from happening is more policing. And there are violent people out there on the prowl that we need police to protect us from. So we know that the AJC's coverage was incredibly one-sided and that clearly they have some sort of interest in propelling this project. And so we can ask, what is the AJC's stake? What is their interest? Why do they care? Why, why are they invested in this project? And so there are some obvious answers um, reflecting first the saying that if it bleeds, it leads, meaning that in an increasingly corporatized media landscape, crime headlines generate increased clicks and crucially increased ad revenue. So when corporations own media sources and the goal is profit or the bottom line, um, the reporting that can generate the most clicks and the most attention and the most outrage is the most profitable. But then there's also a deeper and related answer that we can explore by looking at an omission in the editorial board's August piece that urged the creation of Top City and condemned those who delayed it. So that omission, which you can read here as a screenshot um, from the online version of the article that does not appear in the original print version, is that Cox Enterprises owns the AJC and the CEO of Cox Enterprises, Alex Taylor in the bottom left-hand corner, also happens to be leading a campaign to, rise, to raise private funds for Cop City. So $60 million in total. So in other words, there is a direct connection between who owns the media in Atlanta and who is pushing for increased policing. So we can't disconnect but, any of this um, um, I don't from- know. You know, I don't know. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm not- so, Sorry, I just Thank muted that person. Thank you. Um, so I think it's, it's important to note that we can't 
disconnect any of this from the corporatization of media. Um, and it's really stories like these that show how important independent leftist and alternative media are in our movements. And so I'll, I'll give a shout out to the mainline in Atlanta, which published this piece and is doing some really incredible um, reporting. So let's take a look at Cox Enterprises then um, and their CEO, Alex Taylor, and ask why, you know, what they did, what, what, what did their advocacy look like, and why they might have a stake in policing. So in addition to serving as CEO of Cox Enterprises, Alex Taylor chairs the Atlantic Committee for Progress, um, which is a public-private partnership, probably everyone's heard that term, um, between businesses, government, academic leaders, institutions, um, and institutions. And so it's sort of this public-private think tank body. Um, these are just some of the corporations that are represented on the ACP. Um, and many of these companies are headquartered in Atlanta or Georgia. So setting aside sort of the clear conflict of interest inherent to the AJC reporting on and failing to disclose a key project of its owner, um, we can ask why would Taylor and the ACP or the corporations that ACP represents be so interested in Cop City? How do they fit in to the picture of the PIC? And really understanding ACP's commitment to policing requires understanding the relationship between policing and the development that it advocates. So the ACP's stated mission is to, quote, accelerate Atlanta's competitiveness, competitiveness for attracting residents, businesses, and investment with a high priority on public safety while expanding economic opportunity for all. So in Atlanta, as elsewhere, um, development and investment have translated really to gentrification. So they, um, the ACP was founded in 2003 and they're known for pushing development projects in Atlanta and have really been a major force for gentrification in the city as people have been pushed out of homes um, and rent prices in Atlanta are rapidly rising, often displacing poor and black communities and individuals. Um, you can read more in the piece about some of the specific ways in which um, ACP has sort of had its fingers, all, all, had its hands all through gentrification in the city, projects like the Beltline, um, the Gulch Redevelopment and the West Side Future Fund, um, which are all projects that faced significant community resistance as organizers rallied and pointed out the enormous tax breaks and tax maneuvering that, have res that has resulted in public dollars being used to subsidize corporate profits. Um, but knowing what we know about the ACP's involvement in development projects in particular, um, and in making Atlanta a place that is supposedly more attractive for business investment, we should ask specifically then, you know, what does that mean about their stake in policing and punishment and how are they tied in? I'm gonna pause for the interpreter to catch up. Great, all right. Um, so let's first talk about gentrification and how it ties in with policing. Um, so put really simply, gentrification requires policing. Police protect property and capital investments from protest, from people who are struggling to survive, from people who are considered undesirable. Police actively clear out the homeless and the poor who threaten rosy conceptions of development and prosperity that accompany these new projects. So, you know, you see the flashy renderings of new projects that, of course, require the disappearing of the people who currently live there, whether in homes or encampments. Um, we know that police are there to protect capital, to protect property. And if we think back to ACP's mission statement, they explicitly actually link public safety, which of course means policing, to this business competitiveness. So for ACP, policing and, and creating an attractive business environment um, are fundamentally linked. And so police facilitate gentrification um, in many ways through increased police presence, through ticketing and arrests for quality of life offenses that drive people out and disappear people into the criminal legal system. Um, and you can read more about this in the piece, but in Atlanta, police are given this duty um, of sort of, of, of clearing people out rather explicitly. So as one former APD officer describes, um, his orders were to begin more heavily policing the gentrifying area surrounding the Bedford Pines apartments in Atlanta. So he was told to give tickets and to make arrests 
so that Section 8 residents who had avoided eviction um, via rent hikes could instead be evicted through a criminal record. And so the, the former officer explained that his orders were to, quote, lock up as many people as possible so we can make these apartments vacant and we can knock them down. More broadly, policing ensures investors that their investments will be quote unquote protected from the poor who would supposedly threaten it. Um, the uprisings I think were a great example of how police protect property and capital as we saw police across the nation deployed to arrest people. Um, and we saw that sort of destruction of property was framed in the media as the worst thing that could possibly happen all while police are literally killing and brutalizing people. Um, and so as organizer Cheryl Rivera has written, there is no resistance to capitalism that has not been met with batons. In other words, police enforce the status quo and the status quo of capitalism is mass racialized exploitation. So when we consider all of this, I think it should be no surprise that the ACP board chair, Alex Taylor, agreed to spearhead the fundraising effort for this project. This is not a, a, a warm-hearted effort to make people feel safe. This is a business investment for the many interests that are represented by ACP to maintain the conditions for wealth accumulation. Likewise, then, it's no surprise that the AJC, the media, reported favorably on the effort. This is systemic. This is how the PIC works. I'm gonna take a deep breath. So beyond um, ACP and the many corporation or many corporations and the interests that it represents, um, we can also look to other ways in which corporate, state, and police interests organize themselves at the local level. Um, and so one really key organization in Atlanta is the Atlanta Police Foundation or APF. Um, and so I wanna first talk a little bit about police foundations more generally. Um, this isn't something that I've done a lot of study on, um, but there's a great report that Color of Change and Little Sis put out recently that you can see um, a screenshot of on the left um, that really begins to map some of the relationships behind police foundations. I do wanna give a sort of a caveat up front um, that I don't want to put forward police foundations as like the new private prison company where it's like, okay, here is the thing everyone should target. This is, this is the reason, dark money from corporations, um, you know, that we have mass incarceration. So much of this is so local. And I think that doing this sort of mapping of relationships in the PIC is about assessing who holds power and how they organize themselves. So in some places, maybe, maybe that's a police foundation. In a lot of places, it's police unions. Um, and in others, it's both. Um, Atlanta does not have a very strong police union. And it's a, it's a pet theory of mine that maybe that's why APF is so influential, but that's for another time. Um, so police foundations are private, nonprofit um, organizations that operate in most US cities to do things like raise funds for local police departments, expand police budgets, donate technology, um, supplement surveillance systems, test new weapons and equipment, um, and often serve as public relations for the police. Corporations from every major sector pour money into police foundations um, through which money is money and technology is then channeled into policing and into police departments. And that remains shielded from most transparency and accountability mechanisms. Um, I wanna highlight here that for corporations that donate to police foundations, donations I think should really be better understood as investments. So as the color of change report documents, many corporations are quote, donating with one hand and profiting with the other. So beyond the general return on investment to be found in greater police protection for capital um, and surveillance of those who would threaten it, many donors to police foundations later actually become city contractors for the police that they helped to fund. Um, and so especially when it comes to technology and surveillance companies um, who gain you know, lucrative contracts with police departments. I wanna highlight this quote though from Ruth Wilson Gilmore where she notes that um, foundations, and I think the nonprofit world more broadly, um, are repositories of twice stolen wealth, stolen first through the exploitation of workers in the form of profit, 
and second, through the shielding from taxes because of foundations nonprofit tax status. Um, and I think we can argue here that in the case of police foundations, twice stolen wealth is then channeled into creating the conditions for greater wealth concentration and further exploitation by the same corporations providing the funding. Um, so you can read more about APF, the Atlanta Police Foundation in the piece, um, but you should know that it has long terrorized Atlanta's black, homeless, and otherwise vulnerable communities. So they were founded in 2003. They fund the Operation Shield surveillance network in the city, uh, making Atlanta the most surveilled city in the nation. Um, they, they fund and, and facilitate predictive policing platforms in the city. They've been really they've been sort of a key player behind a lot of rollbacks to reform, um, and they've consistently pushed for increased funding and power for the police. And so coming back to Cop City, um, their most recent project has been promoting, designing, and advocating for Cop City. So it was APF that selected and created plans for the site. They evangelized the need for the facility publicly, um, and they committed two thirds of the, of the proposed facility's price tag. So $60 million um, to be paired with $30 million in public funds. And in fact, they've been working since at least 2017 to create Cop City. Um, so the, the 2017 is the first time we know of that they were presenting on the need for a new facility um, and proposed the South River Forest as a site and approached council members about it. It wasn't, however, until 2021 that then Mayor Bottoms, Keisha Lance Bottoms, created an advisory committee to offer recommendations on the project. Um, and you can read in the piece that that advisory committee really just gave a rubber stamp um, to everything that APF had already designed um, and didn't include community members, despite the administrative order requiring that community members be involved. So APF has lobbied council and the mayor's office continually to push through this proposal. Um, and we're gonna zoom in on a date in June, 2021, right before the proposal went before the finance committee of city council. So um, uh, you know, any, any bill that comes before council always has to work its way through the committee structure uh, before it can come before the full council. And so this was when the bill was going in front of the finance committee. So on June 13th, 2021, um, Atlanta Police Foundation's CEO, Dave Wilkinson, sends an email to John Keene, who was at the time the chief operating officer for the city, uh, meaning he worked in the mayor's office and was really a key partner in pushing the plan through. So Dave references an email that he's attached from a prominent CEO um, and highlights that this CEO um, as well as others who serve on the Atlanta Committee for Progress, ACP, are really frustrated by the crime surge and they think that not enough is being done, that there's been a lack of support for policing over the past year. Dave says that he knows from a previous conversation with John Keane that city council members are looking for a cover, presumably because they know that the public is against this measure um, but they need a cover, they need a, they need a justification, they need a reason to vote for it. And, and he's aware of that um, sort of a mask off moment. <laughs> um, but he says to give in on this, to vote no on this proposal because of what he calls a small group of environmentalists in the cabs in DeKalb County um, shows how weak the city council is. Um, and he says that the mayor needs to show some leadership um, and encourage the finance committee to pass the proposal. So then comes the letter from the anonymous CEO in Buckhead. He's angry about shootings um, and parties in the streets and water boys. And he says, unless something is done, he's going to have to turn his support toward the Buckhead city movement. Um, so that's the secession movement that I mentioned um, along with other CEOs. So we should be really clear here that this is a threat. This is a threat from those who control capital to, um, to expand policing and punishment or lose your tax base because we will secede. And I think that this email is a really helpful elucidation of the PIC in Atlanta. So we have capitalists, in this case, the Buckhead CEO, who call on their paid representatives, in this case, APF, to lobby the city, the mayor's office and city council to expand policing and incarceration in Atlanta to protect the interests of capitalists. And then this entire process is backed by the threatened flight of white tax dollars. 
Um, and so we're seeing how some of these actors are working together, CEOs, APF, the ACP, the state, all ready to push through this proposal. So we are going to now um, take a 10 minute break to give our access team a break. And when we come back, um, we're going to jump into thinking about how the state, um, how nonprofit actors and how academic actors feed into the PIC as well. Um, so we'll do a little recap of, of what we've done so far and then keep it moving. Welcome back everyone. Thank you, DJ MK. Um, just wanna make sure that our, Okay, great. Just wanted to make sure the, the access team um, is back. All right. Um, so we left off on um, some of the emails from the Atlanta Police Foundation um, and, the, and the Atlanta Committee for Progress CEO. Um, and we're gonna start back up by putting some attention on who was on the other end of those emails. So we're, we're gonna start by looking at some state actors, including John Keane, um, the city chief operating officer, um, who Dave Wilkinson was emailing back and forth with. Um, so we've seen already how state actors have overlapped and been intertwined with um, the actors that we've already discussed. So maybe most prominently, we can think of um, the public-private partnership that is the Atlanta Committee for Progress um, and the interactions between John Keane and the Atlanta Police Foundation. But this is a helpful moment, I think, for us to move into thinking about how state actors, including the mayor, city technocrats and officials, um, city council members, and other state actors themselves actively promoted, conceptualized and facilitated the passage of this proposal. Um, and so as a testament to the fact that we are all always learning and growing, um, even since writing the piece, I've seen some new ways in which um, we really have to keep the state and state actors central in our analysis of the PIC. Um, and so let's ask where the state showed up in, in the cop city process. Um, so we know that John Keane, the COO, was actively engaged in this planning process. Um, he helped with designing the legislation, working with the Atlanta Police Foundation um, to get it passed, whipping votes, facilitating all of the quote unquote community engagement, um, which was a sham by design. Um, and you can read more about how that design played out in the piece. Um, we also know that there's an entire committee and, and council process that the legislation had to go through um, and that it was really kickstarted um, by an advisory committee that was convened by Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. We know that the city committed $30 million in, dollars, um, in public funds to do this project, and, and we know that more money will continue to be poured into policing. Um, we saw city councilors use Cop City and their support for Cop City uh, to show to constituents how supposedly seriously they're taking um, the crime wave and working to re-insure their own re-election through that. And I'm happy to say that um, multiple, multiple council members failed in that effort and were, were voted out um, in, in the next cycle. Um, we also know that in a time of instability, perceived instability, um, actors such as the mayor can portray stability and legitimacy for the city by looking like they're taking crime seriously and acting swiftly to address it. And so all of this is to highlight, um, you know, there, there are public actors engaged in this process from start to finish. We know that um, the state and state actors were really a key player throughout um, sort of the shepherding of, of the cop city ordinance through council, um, key players in making the deal go through. Um, and that state actors are not simply acting, you know, at the will of corporations, just, you know, doing whatever their corporate overlords tell them, um, but they actually have their own stake in the PIC and in expanding the punishment system. Um, and those interests overlap with the interests of, you know, a lot of industry actors. We can think back to critical resistances definition, the overlapping interests. Um, but we should ask in their own right, what is their stake? So what is the city's stake? What is the mayor's stake? What is a council member's stake? What is the, the city officials or the city technocrats stake in, in policing, in punishment? What is their interest? Um, and so I just talked about um, you know, some of the specific ways and reasons that state actors in Atlanta engaged with and supported the cop city proposal, um, but maybe, zooming out a little bit, we can talk about 
um, an insight from, from the, the, the Gilmore and Gilmore piece that I cited earlier um, is that punishment infrastructure gives elected officials a claim to legitimacy and authority and stability. So the maintenance of order, um, something that I've been thinking about and that I wanna learn more about um, from Destin Jenkins' recent book um, is that for cities looking to finance projects, so looking to get the money that they need to finance projects, the threat of riots or property destruction or rebellion actually raises the cost of borrowing because lenders prioritize what they perceive as stability for investments. And so how does our system of finance capital tie in to maintain policing and incarceration by requiring you know, a certain level of policing and perceived political stability? We also know that some localities turn to carceral construction projects because they believe falsely that it will create jobs and, and bring in you know, new revenues through taxes. We have elected officials across the spectrum who use tough on crime talking points to secure their own reelection. Um, and so some, you know, when we're assessing these relationships of power, it's important to know that in Atlanta, Dave Wilkinson of the Atlanta Police Foundation is seen as somewhat of a kingmaker. So he has a multi-decade background in federal government and secret service where he amassed enormous political connections. Um, and politicians in Atlanta know that a road to a successful political career can often be made or broken by someone like Dave Wilkinson. So he wields power and state actors who want to advance themselves are accountable to him. I'll pause. Okay. Um, another way we can think about the state's interest um, is that the state wants to build itself. And as, as many scholars have argued, the state can build itself and its own power through increasing punishment infrastructure. It's also true that the lines between the government and industry can become very blurry and that individuals can cross back and forth between those lines. And so to give you one example, um, after she decided not to run for reelection, former mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms was hired on as a political commentator for CNN. Um, and we should note that it was also Keisha Bottoms who deployed the city's police force as mayor to protect the CNN center from protesters who were protesting ongoing state violence. Um, and the point here is not at all to say that this was, you know, a conspiracy where she scratched their backs and they scratched hers, but rather to say that government and industry are tightly intertwined and individuals um, can move pretty seamlessly across the lines when they all have similar and overlapping interests. We can also look at John Keane, the COO, um, who came to the city from Deloitte Consulting spent about four years working for the city where he honed quite a few industry relationships. And then when the time came, went back into the private sector as a head of business development for a corporation. Um, and so in other words, the state and state actors um, have interests that overlap with industry, absolutely, but also has interests that are distinct and, and state actors in their own right are key players to keep our sights on in the PIC. So we've moved through a variety of public and private actors and talked about how their interests overlap and intersect. Um, and an actor that we haven't spoken about yet is the police themselves. So where were the police throughout this campaign? So in addition to directly advocating for themselves, so you can remember that they organized to call in in favor of the facility in September, um, they were doing the whole time what police do, which is acting as the foot soldiers of capitalism and the PIC by quashing rebellion against the destructive status quo. So on the night that the proposal was passed, there were protests outside of council members' houses, and the police quickly swooped in and made arrests, just as they did the summer before, when they arrested hundreds of people in just a couple weeks who again were seen as a threat to the status quo. This, you know, this this is what the police do, and so, um, oh, and it, you know, it's important to note um, in this that the police are political actors who know their power and work as political agents to shape the world and to grow their power. Um, they have power and they wield it. We can see this is a tweet from um, the night of the vote, where a reporter notes that he just spoke with a city council member who said that this vote was especially tough because if they voted no, 
the Atlanta Police Department and the Atlanta Fire and Rescue Department might not be as helpful in their district. And so in other words, this city council member felt in some ways that the police were holding their district's police protection ransom in exchange for getting what they want. Ultimately, even those who voted um, against the facility, so the four who voted against the facility, themselves felt the need to clarify that they actually did support a new police training center, just not in the proposed location. In other words, the police have a firm grip on the power structure of the city, and people are scared, including those in power. So we can ask then, what is APD's stake? What is their interest in policing? And this one is a little easier. <laughs> um, these answers are certainly not exhaustive, um, but for one, it's their job. People fight to protect their interests, their livelihoods, their source of power and authority, um, and that's what the police do. Another example we can think of is that this is a chance to get their hands on a shiny new facility with shiny new equipment. Um, this is a chance for increased resources and power and legitimacy and authority. Um, it's a way for the police to justify themselves after public confidence in policing fell drastically in 2020. And so they, you know, I, I hope, <laughs> obviously, police have a direct interest in expanding their own power and domain. They are not neutral actors who are accepting marching orders. Um, they are actively carving out the world, um, a world that is shaped around policing. All right, so we've worked through um, these actors. We've talked about um, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the media. We've talked about ACP and APF and the corporations that they represent and why they have a stake and an interest in policing. We've talked about how the police are political actors who work to expand their own power. We've talked about all of the ways in which state actors have an interest in expanding the reach of, punishment, of the punishment system and how they do it. And I actually wanna highlight now um, a couple more examples of actors that could be used to fill out this map even further that I didn't explore in the piece um, and that I hope you know, we, we will continue to explore and continue to build out. And so, again, I wanna reiterate that in doing this sort of mapping, we wanna think broadly about the many different actors involved with and invested in the punishment system, whether those actors seem, you know, obvious and, and you know, directly involved or indirectly involved. And so we wanna think, um, you know, for example, about the way in which nonprofits give cover to the violence of policing and do PR for them. And I know that my uh, New York abolitionists on the call have a lot to say about um, how, how nonprofits um, can provide support and cover for the punishment system. And I'm sure many others as well. Um, but to take an example out of Atlanta, um, so in the weeks leading up to the vote in early September to, to paint a picture, um, organizers were working overtime. So they were canvassing, calling, protesting, doing all the things that you do as part of a campaign. Um, and so as I'm scrolling Twitter, as I do, you know, for 10 to 12 hours a day, that was my joke that I worked in for the presentation. Um, you know, so I'm scrolling Twitter and in the midst of seeing these, you know, various developments in the fight against Cop City, all of, all of these efforts, incredible organizing, um, I also see come across my feed a community policing event um, that would be a conversation hosted between 20 Atlanta Police Department officers and 20 community members um, to supposedly build trust. So this event is being promoted um, at the same time that this campaign against Cop City is happening. And so APF is a sponsor of the event. Um, and so too is the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. And so this dinner co-sponsored by these organizations is going to bring together community members and police officers. And so here we have a civil rights nonprofit and the Atlanta Police Foundation, which is an active enemy of community organizers across the city. And I think we have to ask, you know, what are the optics of a prominent human rights nonprofit actively partnering with APF in the midst of this campaign, no less? Um, what does that do for APF's legitimacy? Um, what does it do for this center's um, legitimacy or image? Um, this is just one example of, of the many ways in which nonprofits can be tied up in the PIC, um, even or especially the ones who are supposedly committed to human and civil rights. Um, and so, 
okay, sorry, I thought I heard a noise. Um, and so we can ask them, you know, what might drive a nonprofit to do this kind of work? What, what is their, their stake? Um, especially when, you know, this nonprofit knows what's going on around them in their city. Um, and we can start to see some answers when we look at funding streams and programming. And there are whole books written about um, the nonprofit industrial complex. But to just take a couple examples, we can first look at the fact that the center received a large grant to develop a police training program um, that they would develop and then do for the entire Atlanta police force paid for by the Atlanta Police Foundation. So they are actively receiving revenue from APF to do this training for the police force citywide. They also recently received public dollars to expand their facilities in downtown Atlanta to include space for a quote, human rights training facilities for courses for police officers. So funding for the organization has been tied to geographic expansion to provide further collaboration with the police. We also know that the center has ties to and is funded by those who are associated with Central Atlanta Progress, CAP, another acronym, uh, which is another organization um, that has been a propeller of development projects across Atlanta that have um, resulted in increased policing and warehousing of poor people. And so the point here is really not to focus in on this organization in particular, um, but rather to think about how when we're mapping the interests involved in the PIC, we want to be attentive to the funding, to the relationships, to the history, um, to everything that's apparent sort of on top, but also everything that we have to uncover between actors um, who might seem otherwise disconnected. Relatedly, we want to think about how institutions such as universities are tied in. Um, so thinking back to the Atlanta Committee for Progress, ACP, um, it's not just corporations on that, on that organization. It's also the presidents of universities, including Georgia Tech, Morehouse College, Spelman College, Emory University. So all of these organizations are part of the effort to create Cop City. And so then we can ask, what is the university's stake in policing and punishment? How are they tied in? And again, I think for all these questions, there are far more answers than, than what you're gonna see on the screen. Um, but we can think about when it comes to universities, research funding and prestige that comes along with studying and supporting policing. Um, we can think of the NYU Policing Project, the Yale Center for Policing Equity, different university bodies that really do PR and research that ultimately defends policing. Um, Stop LAPD spying um, has done some really important work in exposing these connections between university centers and police forces um, and the funding that this creates for universities. Um, and then my friends and comrades, Mon and Sarah um, also wrote an incredible piece about sort of this genre of, um, of, of, of police studies that hopefully someone can drop in the chat. And if not, I can, I can find at some point, but you should read it. Um, we also know that universities have their own stake in a perception of stability and security that they imagine to achieve through campus policing, um, leading to student movements right now across the country working to get cops off campus. We can also think about radical student movements as a significant part of histories of liberation work um, and how universities have continually worked to suppress those movements through arrests and other disciplinary mechanisms. Um, and then last, we should think about how many universities are places of extreme wealth hoarding through massive endowments. And once again, wealth hoarding is made possible through police protection. Um, I would say this is um, you know, an underexplored part of my research and of the piece so far. Um, but the point again is to say that we have to think about how, how many different people's livelihoods and the institution's metrics of success are tied in to policing and punishment. So that's a summary um, of some of the actors, institutions, and interests involved. Um, and I hope it wasn't too overwhelming, though I do know it's a lot. Um, and I want to end this section on a note of hope by quickly highlighting um, the resistance to Cop City that has continued to take place since the ordinance passed in September, um, because organizing and resistance matter a lot, and they made a difference um, in this project. Um, and, and I still have the potential to stop the project altogether. Okay. 
So as some of the, uh, the city's efforts to begin demolition and construction have begun, an autonomous network of organizers and individuals has set up encampments um, and, and sabotaged machinery, construction machinery, in the, in the forest area. They've occupied trees, which is um, a tactic that has long been used in land defense campaigns. Um, they have you know, continued to resist, to slow down the cop city effort through direct action, um, and really to take every measure possible to stop cop city from becoming a reality. Um, I'll also say that in the lead up to the proposal's passage, um, even though you know, ultimately that battle was lost and the ordinance passed, organizers picked up some really significant wins along the way that I think are, are worth highlighting. Um, and so for one, the, 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 or the campaign um, eventually brought down the acreage for the project from 150 acres to 85. So you know, nearly cut it in half. Um, one of my biggest takeaways is that we can, you know, celebrate and sort of take heart in the fact that organizers on the campaign mobilized thousands of people in the city against Cop City. So all of these people who, you know, were, were educated about what is going on and why they should oppose it were then able to see for themselves on the ground that our representatives do not answer to us. So, you know, that they, we saw that Atlantans could demonstrate overwhelming opposition to a project and that it could still swiftly pass anyway because of how many other interests there are acting on our representatives. And I think that that in itself is a really, can be a really radicalizing moment for a lot of people who are then motivated to, to join in the struggle that is ongoing. Um, and so in other words, all that to say, I think even though the campaign ended in a loss, Stop Cop City organizers have shown us exactly why it is worth it to fight against the PIC. And I think that um, that's really encapsulated in this quote from Kelly Hayes. And so Kelly writes, if the end really is only a few decades away and no human intervention can stop it, then who do you want to be at the end of the world? And what will you say to the people you love when time runs out? If it comes to that, I plan on being able to tell them I did everything I could, but I'm not resigning myself to anything and neither should you. Adapt, prepare, and take the damage done seriously, but never stop fighting. And so in other words, I think that you know, what Kelly's saying here and I think what, what this campaign shows is that to give in is to ensure that we lose. Um, whereas to fight and to struggle and to organize is to at least leave open the possibility of winning. All right, that's the end of section two. We have 24 minutes. Um, I'm going to move through um, this tool relatively quickly. And I think that, um, oh, nice, Man, you dropped that in the chat, great. Yeah, so Aaron just dropped in um, the PIC mapping tool. If you wanna go ahead and click on um, that link, we'll just, we'll just move through it pretty quickly. Um, so this, this resource is really an attempt to compile um, some thinking and some visualizations of the PIC together um, and to provide a pathway into doing um, some similar mapping to what you saw tonight. Um, and I do want to say thank you to Dan B. Kim um, for their incredible um, design work on this. So um, the resource begins with sort of a brief ref reflection on um, why it's important to think about the PIC in this moment. Um, why it's important in our abolitionist efforts um, to, to have this analysis of the PIC and the many different actors involved. Um, and then it offers just a compilation of some definitions um, across the years from a broad range of organizers and scholars and people who have been struggling against the PIC for a long time. It then offers um, some visualizations, some of which I shared today. Um, that I hope offer, um, yeah, a way of, you know, visualizing the PIC at different levels um, and understanding the many actors involved. And it is, of course, bigger in the, in the resource, so you'll be able to see um, all, all of these different pieces. And then last, it offers a set of questions to think through um, how someone can create a similar map in, in any locality. So um, it's got questions that I hope are helpful in identifying some of the different actors involved. Um, and, and for each question, there's um, sort of the, the answer from Atlanta or an answer from Atlanta of how we can begin to answer. 
Um, and so, you know, it thinks through government actors. How can we, how can we begin to, to put together who all the government actors are? Um, what about industry? What about the media? Um, we want to think through nonprofits and universities and police and law enforcement. Um, and then it asks, who else? Who else can we put on this map as we look to more effectively organize against the PIC? Um, as we look to shift power for a vision of abolition that allows everyone to thrive and to be free from the police, from the violence of policing and racial capitalism. Um, and so hopefully this tool is at least just a helpful launch point um, for doing some of this mapping um, and putting together some of the pieces. Um, and if anyone, you know, uses it, I would love to hear from you. Um, please feel free to reach out. I can drop my, uh, my email in the chat at the end of this. Um, but we have about 20 minutes left, um, and that's really all I have to say. I wanted to say, you know, thank you to everyone who joined tonight and to the organizers um, who, who made this event possible. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be, I'd be happy to, to try to answer them. Um, but also everyone might be happy to go and get 20 minutes of your night back. Thank you so much, Micah, for joining us and for this terrifically informative and engaging presentation, and also for making that tool, which is such an important part of, I think, the work that we're doing, all of us as abolitionist organizers, is to create the tools that help us to be more discerning, ask, help us ask the right questions um, or better questions. And then also provide us with guides and maps. Um, you know, a map is not the territory, but it is a roadmap towards trying to figure out where we can head um, in a better direction. So, so, so grateful to you. Um, do people want to put your questions in the chat if you have them? If there's any questions, I will read them out to Micah. Let me see if I can see if there are any. There's just a lot of thank you. Mm -hmm. Very lots of excitement for using the tool and appreciating their resources. Let me see here. Helpful presentation, well structured toolkit. Question for Micah. I think I missed the part where you mentioned West Side F Future Fund. Could you speak more about how it is connected to ACP and APF? Yes. Oh boy. I am off mute. Um, yeah, so so the West Side Future Fund um, is is a project of um, of the ACP um, and is is really I think you know another it, it's technically its own organization, um, but it's it's really and I think it was incubated by the ACP, but it's really been um, sort of just an, another vehicle for this sort of um, you know downtown and West Side development that has. Um, contributed to, you know, the dynamics of gentrification and displacement in Atlanta. Um, and so it's sort of, you know, just, just one more part of this, um, of this ecosystem that, you know, that the ACP is related to. And there's so much overlap, um, you know, in, in all of these actors. Mm -hmm. uh, another question for those of us working for NGOs, how do we hold them accountable? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> you have the answer to that question. I was yeah, yeah. very quickly. Um, <laughs> yeah, I I don't have a good answer. Um, you know, I work for a nonprofit, um, and you know, it's always my goal to to you know try to align um, you know what what we're doing as an organization with um, an abolitionist vision, even though you know my the, the organization that I work for um, you know wouldn't describe itself as abolition, abolitionist. Um, but I think it comes down to, you know, a lot of conversations and being willing to have hard conversations um, and also organizationally being willing to take accountability for, you know, past efforts um, and initiatives that maybe, you know, we, we've since learned have been harmful um, or, you know, or don't actually move us toward um, you know, the future we want. So I think I would just add that, you know, these are not individual, you, you as a one person can't do much. Yeah, many of you together banding together can have much more impact. So I always tell people it's like find the other people in the organization that also mm. feel the way that you do, and organize together to pressure, you know, um, because I think 
we just get picked off when we're individuals coming at these things. And I think part of what the cop city experience shows is that you got to get a lot of people. And even if you get a lot of people and a lot of voices, you still may not win. But things are different than when you started. And so I think that's the, a, a big way to think about it. Another question is, how can we implement this in New York City? Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, I hope that, um, I hope that people can, um, you know, I, I know there's already such an amazing, you know, ecosystem of organizing in New York City, um, you know, to the extent that this sort of tool is, is helpful in, in thinking about this, um, you know, I, I hope that, um, you know, New York City organizers can, will, will find this useful. Great. Uh, what is something you learned that you didn't expect by going through this mapping process? So much, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't, but before I started, you know, doing, doing this research, um, I, I didn't know so much of this. Um, I didn't see how the pieces fit together. Um, and, you know, I, I was in, you know, I, I supported the, the campaign and, and, you know, some of the organizing that was happening. I was not, you know, any sort of core organizer or, or main organizer with, um, with, with the, the Stop Cop City campaign. Um, but yeah, I, I learned a lot about Atlanta um, and a lot about how these pieces fit together. So I think that, you know, until you are, are really doing it and working through these questions, um, it's hard to know who all is involved. Mm -hmm. um, were there any hard boundaries organizers in Atlanta, you may not be able to answer this, decided on regarding which actors within this mapping they would not under any circumstances engage with? I would assume that the police were the, were the line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I can't give a, a definitive answer. I don't know if any, you know, if anyone on the call um, can um, from, from Atlanta, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say probably some cl some classic ones like the police. <laughs> um, Mon says the difficult as as fuck questions. <laughs> yes, yes, very difficult question. Um, have there been any investors in the ESJ sustainability space who have been pushing back in collaboration with organizers? Any successful tactics? That's a great question. Um, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure about um, that, but that would be a great place to look into. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the answer to a lot of these questions is I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, can you briefly address uh, or share quote wins that came from cop city organizing in the form of new connections. One example could be the historic return of the Muska uh, Muscogee Creek Nation to the forest for the stomp dance, fostering connections between organizers and indigenous folks. That's one question. Yeah, so absolutely. Answer, um, and answered their thank, question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, um, Andrew. Yeah, th I think. Um, what, what Andrew mentioned as, as an example, I think is really important. Um, something that I think a lot of the campaign organizers, um, you know, um, realized and, and, you know, tried to be accountable for was um, a lack of outreach to um, the Muscogee Creek Nation and, and indigenous communities, um, you know, whose, whose land this is. Um, and so um, in, I think it was in December of 2021, um, organizers and, and, and people from the Muscogee Creek Nation um, came together for a stomp dance um, ceremony in, in Atlanta. Um, and it was, you know, a way to sort of build up these connections and solidarity um, and, and in some ways, you know, account for um, the lack of relationship in the campaign before um, and, and, you know, be accountable going forward, which was really amazing. Do you have any advice for how to meaningfully invite folks to understand and comprehend state violence as a form of violence, arguably the most egregious and large scale form of violence? There seems to be a lot of resistance on the part of self-identified anti-violence individuals in accepting that policing is by nature violent and not reformable. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the um, abolitionist insight. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, yeah, I don't know that I have any, um, you know, any specific advice. I think that it's, um, you know, we, we can move from individual examples to, you know, to the large scale results of this system. You know, I think we should point out to people that, you know, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a product of systemic violence to not have um, a home, to not have clean drinking water, 
um, that, you know, those, those are all manifestations of state violence and they have, you know, direct impacts on people's minds and bodies. Um, and so I think we should always be drilling home that point that you're, that you're sharing. I mean, the, the answer is, I mean, frankly, honestly, the answer is in the question, which is yeah. that it's an insight that you have, that you have to continuously communicate, and you can only yeah. do that in relationship with others, talking about it at every time, at every turn, in any spaces, you know, and reinforcing that. There's, there's no other way but through. I know people want the, like, other, like, this is just the work. It's painstaking. It's one-to-one -one over time for a long time. The insight that you gained, think of how long it took you to get there. I mean, I always tell people that, like, like, think of how long it took you to get the insight that that kind of violence is violence. You didn't come mm. out of the womb with it. Somebody taught you, if not your experience, the world, an individual, something you read that moved you. That's the same thing for every single individual that is on this planet. And if, when we think of it that way, I think we have a lot more grace for people and also grace for ourselves. So I just think that's important to keep in mind. Um, in my area, we've been working against the building of a, a new women's prison. Uh, when these active campaigns for PIC are happening, what ways can this mapping tool support us in holding perspective with the community? How do you communicate this tool? That's a great question, um, and one that I'm, you know, hoping <laughs> I, I, I'll continue to learn about um, and, and understand because this is, you know, a new tool and you know a relatively new. Thing that I, you know, that that we put together, um, I think that the the value for me and in, in my, you know, in in, in the, the groups that I'm a part of um, has been seeing the bigger picture. Um, I think sometimes it's easy to focus on, you know, one one actor or like, you know, we just need to like focus on, you know, this council member or focus on the way this corporation is behaving or you know whatever it might be, um, and we can get sort of stuck into, um, you know, specific silos. And so I think that, you know, for, for, for me and my, um, in, in the political work that I'm a part of, being able to see all these connections is useful because it helps us know, you know, where, where, where can pressure points be? Not that we have to target every single, every single actor, um, but when, when, we're, when we're assessing, you know, for our campaign, what are the pressure points? Where are the, where are the points of connection? And how can we, you know, devise a, a campaign around one of those and, you know, cut it, cut it off um, at, at various points? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think you use it as a political education tool with your people, you know, uh, map, do the, your own mapping. That's how you communicate it. And I think the second way you might communicate it, if you don't have a chance to be engaged with people on a regular basis, is find a group of people to map with and then make a bunch of copies of the maps, wheat paste them in all communities, hand them out at the cafes and the laundromats and the, you know, every possible place, the supermarket, in some pamphlet format, engage people to think about it on their own. So, I mean, we have so many means of communication. Use IG and make a little, you know, animated version of it and circulate that amongst people. We, there is no limit to how we can share information in this day and age. Some of us grew up when we were mimeographing our zines, okay? We are going to date ourselves. And that was a totally different way. Yet, you know what? People communicated with each other then too. So we got yeah. so many more tools, everybody. Like, we have to get a little bit more... I don't know, less down on ourselves or downtrodden or like, we don't know, we don't have, we have mm. so many friggin' ways of getting information out to people. It's just the limit on our imagination uh, of how to do it. So I say, you know, do or, uh, call a meeting and start the mapping process. I invite people to join you to help you do the map as one activity or an event once you are ready to be in person with people again. Can't be in person, do it virtually. We can do so much. So just putting that out there. What I'm going to turn the questions over to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm adding in because I always feel like, you know, we got so much. We got so much. We, we have made such progress, y'all. Such progress. Yeah. I yeah. promise you. Okay. Like 25 years ago, people were laughing us out of every single room. That's not the mm. case anymore. Yeah. And if you are, if you live long enough, you see those changes. And so I think people have to, you know, just, just keep pushing, 
keep pushing. That's the bottom line. All right. What questions do you have at this point in your research and organizing? Just a general small question there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have questions. Uh, I have questions that say like, go bigger and think about all of the, you know, the state and national and international actors um, and, you know, wanting, you know, wanting to map all that out. And then I also have, you know, really concrete questions that, you know, some people have raised of uh, once you can see it, what do you like, what do you do? What's the most effective way, um, you know, to make use of, and, and you know, not, and not make use of my insight, make use of, you know, the PIC as a concept that I, you know, that I'm finding increasingly useful as I feel like I've understood, you know, the utility of the PIC more. And so, you know, I have, you know, smaller and bigger questions of like, how, what, how do you devise the most effective campaigns based on, you know, based on what insight of the PIC teaches us? How many people and how much time was needed for this map? Um, <laughs> this was, well, so I would say, you know, a lot of conversations, you know, with people informed, um, making the map, ultimately it was me doing things on first drawing and then, and then doing things on Canva. Um, it took a while. <laughs> I don't know how many hours, but it, it took some time. Great. Did the city council election result in some favorable changes? It did. Um, and, you know, I would... The, the cop city movement was not an electoral one um, at all, um, but I actually think it helped produce some electoral wins um, in that the sponsor of the legislation lost her seat. Um, you know, a, 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 a strong supporter of the legislation lost her seat, um, a candidate who was running um, on a really sort of pro-jail, pro-police platform lost that race. So there, there were some, some electoral outcomes um, that, you know, have, have been um, useful in, in, in our current organizing. Excellent. Um, what about uh, somebody named Andre Dickens? Where is Andre Dickens at on Cop City? He is our new mayor um, and he voted for the, the ordinance in September as a city council member. Um, all indications show that he is supporting the project still. Did you encounter any connections in your context to healthcare or public health actors? Thinking a lot about how much collaboration is pointed out around crisis intervention teams of mental health nurses and cops, mm -hmm. cops and psychiatric involuntary detention that uses police to detain people labeled by the psychiatric system. Yeah, um, it's it's not been something that I've looked into, um, but you know even seeing, you know, seeing you say that, uh, you know, of course, that that's a key area. I think there's um, someone on the call, Mark Spencer, who's who's an abolitionist physician in Atlanta. Um, and yeah, I, I think that that's a, that's a place where I would, you know, go from here. Um, and there there are right now, um, there's a there's a program in Atlanta called PAD, Policing Alternatives and Diversions, Diversion that works with healthcare workers to divert people from, you know, before they're even arrested. Um, but I think, you know, thinking more broadly about the way that, you know, the medical system and the medical industrial complex plays into this um, is, is equally crucial in this sort of mapping. And it's something that I would add to the next one. Thank you, Micah. Last question I'll ask and then we'll break. Um, has this project changed the way you view electoral politics? For example, how worthwhile is it being involved with local council or mayoral races? Ugh, I don't know where I am on electoral politics. I'm disillusioned. Mm. Um, I, you know, I think it matters. Um, I, you know, it, it matters who's in power. And also it, it has, you know, it, it's, it's, I think it's just, I think it's broadened my, my power analysis in some ways in understanding that, you know, it's not about, it's, you know, we, we can never just take, you know, someone who's in elected office at sort of face value of, of what they say, because there are so many forces working on them all the time. And there are so many of their own interests that can run counter to, um, you know, to, to, to the goals of the movement. So yeah, it's, it's shifted and it's continuing to shift the way I think about electoral politics. Yeah, I think, I think we should also pay attention to the fact that we don't have a shortage of people. Well, we do have a lot of people who don't engage at all in electoral politics, like half the country. But in terms of like quote civic engagement, voting and electoral organizing is the kind of organizing 
Like it's the private. So I don't think everybody has to engage in that. <laughs> like I, think, I think that if you're an abolitionist organizer, it's fine to do a whole bunch of other things, you know, right. and vote if you want to. But I don't think it has to be the <laughs> core strategy that we take on. And I'm not really that interested in arguing that out constantly. I think it's a waste of our time, honestly. <laughs> If I wanted, if I want to just put it out there, you know, like, I like, okay, whatever it's there. You should use it if you want to, it's a tool, blah, blah, right. blah, but let's keep it moving. We got bigger fish to fly <laughs> keep moving. At this moment. So focus on what you want to. Um, all right, y'all, it has been great. Micah, again, applause, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Fantastic work. Thank you for the resource. Thank you to all of you for staying on till 830. I know. What? I know, amazing. We appreciate you. Come back if you want to for our next sessions, uh, the next one in April, April 28th. And then after that, we're doing an active listening 101 session in May, May 25th. So keep a look, an eye out everybody. Good night.